So grace and peace to you from our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And Merry Christmas. All right. Thank you. This is still Christmas season after all. Um, you know, we start kind of with Advent in a lot of ways, lighting candles and opening Advent calendar doors or whatever our practice may be to just count down the days to Christmas, anticipation, excitement. It's here. It may have passed, but it's still a season that we enjoy for how many days that we start counting now? To 12, the 12 days of Christmas that we count up to. So for those of you counting, this is day two. So if you're looking to do some shopping for your true love, you may want to get two turtle doves and a partridge and a pear tree. I'm making notes there, I see, yeah. During this Christmas season, though, we hear from scriptures about Jesus' birth, and in this, this section, too, of Luke is Jesus' adolescence. Um, Twelve years old, we don't get a lot of those stories, but this is the main one that we do get. This story can be seen in a variety of ways. One way that I thought was interesting to take a look at it was as a coming-of-age story. Jesus, 12 years old, boys, 12 years old, and different things are happening, and they're, you know, just things are happening. And this is Jesus, 12 years old, not much different also in age from his mother Mary. When she was a teenager, hearing from an angel that she would soon bear the promised Messiah, her firstborn son. Jesus increased in wisdom at a young age and is holding his own with the, dis with the adults discussing the scriptures at the temple. And I like how that scripture ended with Mary, his mother, pondering these things in her heart, treasuring them. I imagine that she must have looked at the scene treasuring her boy growing up. That he was, again, similar age when God's plan, like for her life, was being revealed. Maybe she saw some connections there, seeing what was going on, and was reminded of those promises. I imagine she was also maybe grieving, knowing that Jesus wouldn't stay her baby forever, and that uh, maybe raising a precocious child could be challenging. I imagine she felt awful about leaving Jerusalem without him, and was very frustrated with him, and scared herself, but was also maybe proud seeing that Jesus made it on his own, relating to people young and old, finding his place in the temple among other faithful Jews who had just finished celebrating the Passover week of celebration. Let's pause for a moment and remember that, again, Passover was the high holy days of celebration when Jews would come to Jerusalem to celebrate worship and eat a special meal, telling the story of God rescuing their people from slavery in Egypt nearly 2,000 years before that. Mary and Joseph and family and friends would have traveled again probably three days from Nazareth to get to uh, Jerusalem, about 100 miles, to spend the week of celebration before heading back. Three more days of travel, unless you're just anxious to get home and you push it to two, right? You're just, I think we can do it. I pictured a bit like an annual family road trip somewhat of a vacation. You know, load up the caravan, enjoy the adventure on the open road. Have you ever had those kind of trips? Have you ever left on a trip and then at some point realized that you forgot something at home? Left something behind? Something didn't make it in your suitcase? Or in this case, maybe someone didn't make it into the car? I've tended to forget a few things and just to uh, remember them, usually pulling out of the driveway, making that first or second turn within the mile, and you're like, oh, wait, no, let me go back, take care of that, pick that back up, something that I had forgotten. In the case of Scripture today, though, Jesus was left in Jerusalem as the family and friends were heading back north, only to realize he wasn't with the group when they stopped for the night on the first day on their back, going back on the road trip. They must have been frantic as they turned around to head back to find him. Apparently, it took a total of three days to find him there in the temple. And sometimes, I think, again, we read scripture just so matter-of-factly that it doesn't really stand out as such a big deal. Yeah, you know, they went back, they turned around, they found him, da-da-da. But, I mean, if you've ever been left or forgotten, or if you've left or forgotten a family member, it's kind of a big deal. It's kind of something usually you remember. Maybe you continue to tell stories about and all this kind of stuff, too. There's a lot of emotions flying around at those times. 
And to help us a little bit relate, um, I have this short video clip to play. When the McAllister family left on their Christmas vacation... Did we miss the flight? No, you just made it. Yeah! They forgot one small thing. Have yourself... I've a terrible feeling. Did you lock up? Yeah. Do we set the timers on the lights? Mm-hmm. What else could we be forgetting? Our troubles will be ours. Kevin! Ah! <laughs> Home alone. So I'm assuming you may have uh, known at least that movie or been able to relate with that story. It's certainly a story of separation and estrangement that ends in reconciliation and everyone being home for Christmas. It ends with a hug from a mom and the rest of the family making it home to be together, but a lot happens in between. Uh, it's a movie where the child is the hero. It can certainly be a traumatic experience and disturbing to feel that anxiety of being left alone um, or that you've left someone home alone. But what's highlighted in that story is a coming-of-age story where transformation happens, right? Where Kevin is no longer seen as just a kid, incompetent of tying his shoes when they all get back home. He even did the grocery shopping before they got home. He's shown to be capable of being home alone, and he didn't burn the place down. He survived robbers' attacks. He confronted his fears and took courage and even gave some mature advice to his neighbor, Marley, when he talked with him at the church. Marley must have listened and called his estranged son after their conversation since he's seen hugging his granddaughter through the window at the end of the movie. Kevin wanted his family back for Christmas and asked Santa for that, but on Christmas Day, Santa's cookies and milk are untouched. But it does turn out that Kevin gets his family back for Christmas as they arrive home, his mother first with the hug, a loving embrace, and words from an anxious parent who spent time searching for their child, saying, I'm so sorry, so sorry, Kevin. A child certainly hearing that from a parent can be what they need to hear in moments of uh, traumatic experience or feeling forgotten. But the family is all back together and transformation has happened. Uh, Kevin is a little bit more grown up. Mary and Joseph find Jesus in the temple and they show that they're feeling a lot of emotion toward their firstborn son saying, child, why have you treated us like this? We've been searching anxiously for you. But Jesus shares another astounding answer to the adults in the temple, now to his parents, saying, did you not know I must be in my father's house? So in that, Jesus is claiming and, in, in, and is living his identity as a child of God. His earthly father, Joseph, as well as Mary, were looking for him, but Jesus replies with an understanding of scripture that he is at home in the temple with God. We can all claim that, again, in our baptism. This is part of what we celebrate today, being part of the family, being part of, joined to the children of God. This final week of our preaching series of best Christmas ever has been a time to draw our attention um, as to how we like to focus on the ideal, most perfect, best part of celebrations that we idealize. And yet, really, when we zoom out a little bit more, and we hope people don't, zoom out a little bit more and see that our lives may be a little messier and tragic. Um, and yet when we zoom out of the Christmas story with Jesus' birth um, in a stable, it seems a little messy and tragic as well. So in our created worlds of social media, we can try to fake it till we make it. We can try to put on the right face. We can do all of those things. But the good news of the Christmas story and of the story of Jesus in his adolescence is that in the midst of something imperfect and messy, God still comes to be with us. It didn't stop God from coming. God knows everything about us, so we don't need to try to hide anything from God. If you've been trying hard to hide and keep up those appearances with God, the good news is that you've made it with God. Jesus has come. Jesus knows what it's like to be human and shares that with us. You can relax in the presence of God who knows you you can take a deep breath and know that God's love for you is strong and sure and eternal. The picture of our Christmas may not be perfect. The picture of Jesus' birth was not perfect, at least in our world's eyes. But what is perfect, maybe what we learn about perfection from God, is that it's precisely coming to love what is imperfect, 
unconditionally, compassionately, and boldly. There's perfection in that act of loving. So it's good news to hear that even if you're forgotten by the world or your family or the church, God will not forget you. God takes you up as a child in loving arms and brings you home. Also, we hear that children are the church of today, not of tomorrow, not of someday in the future when they can contribute financially, but of right now, today. And they are certainly capable of revealing God to us and to the world. Amen.